Joseph Jojo Vitaco was born in 1927 and was raised and reared on the gritty streets around his Williamsburg neighborhood and the adjoining section of Greenpoint. This area would remain Jojo's underworld stomping grounds and home for the rest of his life. As a teenager, Jojo met and quickly became friends with an older kid from the Greenpoint neighborhood by the name of John Francis, who was eight years his senior. Francis, of course, would go on in future years to gain infamy as the notorious mafia enforcer known as Sonny Francis. The two young men quickly discovered they were simpatico in their view of life. They were both tough street kids through and through, and they soon teamed up together. At the time, Francis was quickly gaining a reputation for himself around the North Brooklyn neighborhoods of Greenpoint, Williamsburg, and Ridgewood as a tough, no-nonsense young hoodlum and criminal. His father, Carmine Francis, was a well-known camarista who owned a Greenpoint bakery and tavern that doubled as his base of operations. And through his father's underworld connections while growing up, the young Francis was able to meet many members of the Neapolitan Camorra and Sicilian Mafia, as well as other varied independent local racketeers. So this greatly helped Helped him to first gain acceptance among Brooklyn's criminal element. Before I continue, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and leave us a comment. By the early 1950s, Jojo Vitaco had been brought aboard and put on record as one of Sonny's close associates. The close friendship between the two young hoodlums and aspiring mafiosi would last a lifetime. At 5 foot 3 inches tall and 135 pounds soaking wet, Vitaco didn't look like much and made a very unassuming impression. Yet, sometimes looks can be very deceiving. As the years passed, Jojo became known as a stone killer who had a well-deserved reputation as a top enforcer serving in a faction under Sonny Francis and, by extension, the Joseph Profaci crime family of Brooklyn. According to mob lore, Sonny Francis had originally started out under the guidance of several friends of his father who were fellow Camarista. They were allied to what was then known as the Luciano Genovese family. During that time, the family's downtown Brooklyn faction was headed by such men as Generoso Tato Del Del Duca and Anthony Little Augie Pisano Carfano. The family underboss was Vito Genovese, a fellow Neapolitan and Camerista who was also thought to have been an early mentor of sorts to Sonny. But not long after starting his association with them, young Francis ran into a problem. A serious problem. It was such a serious problem that it could have cost him his life. So. At a sit-down table, an accommodation was made between mafiosi to spare Francis under an agreement that he could no longer remain affiliated with the Luciano Genovese crew. Instead, it was agreed that the young hoodlum would be transferred to Capo Buster Alloy. From that time forward, Francis and several of his young friends would all become associates of the Joseph Profaci family. Joseph Ataco was among those young men. By the early 1950s, it was believed that Aloy had already sponsored Francis to become a member of the family. Aloy also soon sponsored both Vitaco and another associate of theirs named Joseph Little Joey Brancato for formal induction as well. These three men would serve under Aloy for some years until Francis himself would later rise to a Capo di Decina status. After that, Brancato and Vitaco would form the nucleus of Sonny's crew. As time went on, other men would be added to the ranks, but during their early years together, Francis, Vitaco, and Brancato were nearly inseparable. Despite his demure size, Vitaco was well known to be knee-deep in many of the mob's grittier street rackets. His criminal pedigree included such sordid activities as armed robberies, warehouse loft burglaries, truck hijackings, cargo thefts, fencing stolen goods, shylocking, strong-arm extortions, restaurant and nightclub shakedowns, and contract murder. He was little known outside of the underworld to the general public and the media, but among local law enforcement and his fellow hoodlum element, Jojo Vitaco was very well known. He had a well-earned reputation as a dangerous guy. In July 1955, Vitaco was one of three men charged with the armed robbery of $100,000 in mink coats and jackets taken from a Manhattan wholesale furrier firm named the Bobby Brown Fur Company that previous May. Vitaco's co-defendants included John, Johnny Tarza, and Lesterino, and Richard Langone. During the investigation that later led to all the men getting arrested, police revealed that they had first tracked Vitaco all the way to Europe while looking for evidence against the hoodlums. Vitaco had apparently been given the tail because he was a prime suspect in the sensational $305,000 daylight armed robbery of a Chase Manhattan bank branch in Woodside, Queens in April of that year. It was highly publicized as one of the largest robberies in New York City's history. In June, after an international manhunt, Vitaco was found vacationing in Rome. This was two months after the bank heist and one month before the fur heist. 
He and his vacationing companions, all of whom were suspects in the bank robbery, were questioned for seven hours by Italian police before being released. They had all claimed that they had no idea what was happening and denied knowing anything about the robberies, and they were confounded as to why their names were splashed all over the newspapers. So when the police released them, and since they hadn't found any evidence to support what the American authorities were accusing them of, they apologized to Vitaco and his companions for the mix-up. In July 1956, Vitaka was arrested and held as a material witness in the double axe slaying murders of two known hoodlums and accused truck hijackers then under indictment. Both men had been found in an abandoned automobile parked along a side street on Manhattan's Lower East Side. When detectives arrived on the scene, they found the entire inside of the car soaked in blood. The two victims were later identified as James Orcerto and Vitaco's Fur Heist co-defendant Richard Langone. They were found in the car wrapped in canvas and bound with rope. The New York City Police Department later reported after autopsies that both men had been repeatedly bludgeoned. They also had their skulls crushed in, and both men bore multiple hack wounds from what appeared to have been a hatchet. Each man had been repeatedly hacked so badly that several of the victims' limbs had been severed from their bodies. One local homicide detective who was on the scene at the time described it as one of the goriest murder scenes he had ever witnessed. This type of gangland murder was typically known in the underworld as a buckwheat's killing, where the victims are tortured mercilessly before death. Jojo Vitaka was repeatedly grilled by detectives during an intense investigation, which also included interviews with numerous neighborhood witnesses and underworld informers alike but police turned up scant hard evidence of Itaco's involvement in the murder, and they were eventually forced to release him from custody for a lack of evidence. Langone and Ricerto had been out on $30,000 bail each after their arrest for a Brooklyn fur heist. At the time of their murders, both men were being sought by the FBI as bail jumpers after they failed to show up in court earlier that week. Little did the authorities know that both men hadn't shown up because they had already been killed. Another co-defendant named Louis Musto had also disappeared, and the authorities feared he had met foul play. As an interesting side note, several hours before Langone and Ricerta were found murdered, Abraham Telvey was also found murdered. Telvey was the guy who had thrown acid at columnist Victor Riesel that permanently blinded him, which was supposedly done at the behest of the notorious Johnny Dio. And just to make it a little juicier, Telvi just happened to be a friend of the missing Louis Musto, and both Musto and Telvi frequented a bar often visited by Langone and Rosserto. But while police tried to tie the murders together, there was nothing to tie them together because the murders weren't related in any way. In a semi-related investigation during the Langona Rosserta murder probe, a local Queens detective was brought up on charges of aiding and abetting no mob guys. This happened after a probe by the Internal Affairs Division discovered that a handgun, then being held as police evidence in connection with another local gangland-style slaying, had mysteriously disappeared from the New York City property clerk's office. This Queens detective, coincidentally, was associated with Langone, Rosserto, and Louis Musto. Around the same time, the local police authorities were investigating several other homicides connected to members of the Brooklyn, Queens-based Francis crew. But despite their growing interest in Sonny Francis and his close associates, nothing would ever come from this particular investigation either. In 1958, a Brooklyn squad car on patrol became suspicious of a 10-ton tractor trailer they spotted following a dark green sedan along an abandoned Williamsburg street one early morning. The cops decided to pull both vehicles over to investigate. Vitaco and a buddy were in the car, while two other hoodlums were in the tractor trailer. The cops not only found a fully loaded revolver in the front seat of the car, but also $13,000 worth of stolen brand new rugs and carpeting in the back of the tractor trailer. All four suspects were subsequently charged with grand larceny and truck hijacking. Vitaco was additionally charged with possession of the revolver. From the 1960s forward, Francis and other key members of his crew would come under one of the most intense series of investigations ever undertaken by law enforcement. Both the New York Office of the FBI and New York City Police Department, as well as the Nassau and Suffolk Police Departments out on Long Island, coordinated what amounted to almost 24-hour surveillance seven days a week for years against Francis and his key men. After a series of failed indictments that either resulted in dismissals or acquittals, Francis was finally convicted on federal bank robbery conspiracy charges in 1967. He was sentenced to serve a whopping 50 years behind bars but remained free on bail while appealing his conviction. 
By 1970, he had exhausted all possible appeals and was finally shipped off to begin serving his term at Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas. With Francis now behind bars, Vitaco and other crew members were now reassigned to Joey Brancato, who was elevated as the crew leader. But within several years' time, Brancato was demoted back down to a mere soldier, and Vitaco was subsequently reassigned to serve within the regime of Capo Dominic Donishak's Montemorano. Shortly after that, he was reassigned to Capo Gennaro Jerry Lang Langella, and still later, he was reassigned and moved over to Andrew Andy Mush Russo. Joseph Jojo Vitaco died in 1980 of failing health. If you'd like to read the full biography of Jojo Vitaco or our exclusive bio on Joey Brancato, head on over to the Button Guys website at www.thenewyorkmafia.com. And don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and leave us a comment. Thank you for watching. Until next time.